Yeah. Thank you, Niall and Colin, for um, organising this event. And of course, to Aji and Marcia, I'm just, yeah, there are no words for um, the value of the work you do and how privileged I feel to just uh, be a part of it. Um, my name is Kevin Ario, and I'm a PhD student at King's College London. And I'll be speaking to Shaney's Law and some of the projects that we've been involved in with the families um, to try and implement this law as effectively as possible to reduce restrictive practice. Um, next slide, please. I'll start by saying that the Mental Health Units Use of Force Act is a new piece of national legislation. It was put forward by a Labour MP called Steve Reid in response to the death of one of his constituents, which was due to excessive use of force on the mental health unit in the Bethlehem Hospital. That constituent was Ola Shaney Lewis, and to honour his legacy, the act is widely known as Shaney's Law. The main focus of the law is, first of all, to reduce the use of restraint in mental health patients and to train staff in the use of alternative ways of keeping people safe. There will be provisions, for example, to um, distribute information to um, patients and carers, to make sure that data is collected um, accurately and responsible, as was alluded to by Professor Tim Kendall, um, and also provisions such as uh, the use of body-worn cameras being mandatory by all police on mental health units um, to really try and make services accountable for this. Um, there are also policies at a higher level that are designed to improve transparency in every trust. So for example, in every trust, there'll be a named person who will be accountable for their local policy on use of force and they will report back to the Secretary of State for an annual review. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to go in depth into two of those areas that I put forward, um, just to show what we've been doing in South London to try and preempt Cheney's law, um, well, to be working in anticipation of it. And one of those areas is in training staff. One of the things that SLAM will be doing is co-producing a course with Aji Lewis that we're going to call Shaney's Story. And the intention behind it is to really give insight into the real impacts that these events have had on families and local communities. I know that one of the themes here today is co-production and I've been reflecting a lot on just how difficult it is for the families to keep continually telling their stories. So I'd encourage everybody to look at the resources that we have in United Friends and Families or the documentaries that we've put out and I'll say more about those later. Um, SLAM will also be reviewing their clinical training and um, there's been engagement with a wide range of stakeholder groups and importantly, not just um, staff and yeah, not just staff, but also community members people with lived experience of restraint and their carers, um, and there have been visits between other trusts. And essentially what we're hopeful of doing is to invite, by inviting all of these different perspectives and sharing these personal testimonies, is that we want to bring something different and really empower staff to challenge the cultures that lead to restrictive practice. We think that now is especially a good time now that there's a different discourse around race and around black men. And in Shaney's case, for example, he was restrained by up to 11 police officers. And we really feel that we need to address the interactions between clinicians and the police and really rethink the police's role in mental health provision, full stop. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, now, there are two sides to Shaney's Law's policies on information provision. It's, of course, important to have a means to collect accurate information, um, so data on the use of prone, prone restraint, for example, and between ethnicity that we don't really have at the moment. But we hope there will be a lot more thought also put into 
how we provide information for families and carers. We know that in many cases, there is frankly mistrust between services and local communities. And we would like the information on what care a person will receive to be framed in a way that really supports people with lived experience and their carers to be as involved in that care as possible. The key question here, I think, is how do we communicate information around care and around medication and restrictive practices to people in the community? And for us, I think it means working with people both who have never been in the system, as well as people who have been in the system, but might have had bad experiences of care. We're really thinking about how different people prefer to access and process this information. And so we'll be using things like social media and community assets to convey these messages. But I think we also have to think about the what's the impact of communicating our practice. This means that we are likely to be challenged and that we need to be open to being challenged and to reflect on what it might be that we aren't seeing as mental health professionals. It reminds us of the impact of restraint on families, even when the practices are considered necessary by staff to keep people safe. And overall, we just think that having this dialogue will bring us much closer to the people we're trying to support and to the organizations who are already supporting them like Inquest and like United Friends and Families. Um, next slide, please. So I know that I don't have much time, so I just wanted to get uh, give a quick run through of the focus groups we did as part of the consultation, the government's consultation for Shaney's Law. I also volunteer with a charity of Black mental health staff called Colourful Minds, and we wanted to feed into the statutory guidance for Shaney's Law before the law comes into effect um, in the near future. And we felt this was really important to get right because the statutory guidance will have a huge bearing on how professionals interpret Shaney's law. We were also aware going into this work that Black people in the UK are disproportionately more likely to be restrained, detained, and to have police involvements than white people are. And I've put some research in the chat if anybody's interested in that. Um, and we are, we really weren't very confident that um, black people's voices were being truly heard or heard enough. So we set up two diverse focus groups, one with people with lived experience of having been restrained and one with um, staff who have worked on inpatient wards. And we spent two and a half hours with each group scrutinizing the guidance. Uh, next slide, please. And just very briefly, we found in general that patients and staff were really quite aligned in their views. When we asked, uh, when we asked participants whether there was a culture of use of force that was designed to get people to comply 100%, so basically um, whether the use of force is coercive, 100% of people with lived experience either agreed or strongly agreed and also three quarters of the staff did as well. So the complexity really wasn't in getting people to agree. It was more in figuring out the wide range of issues that can lead to restrictive practice. And there were more nuanced issues about what is appropriate versus inappropriate use of force and how black men in particular uh, can be stereotyped and perceived as risky when in fact they are the people who need protecting. Um, next slide, please. I just wanted to pull out a couple of quotes, but the, I'll make the report available in the last slide. Um, so building on that theme of perceptions and unconscious bias, one person with lived experience who was a black man reflected that he thought staff were restraining the stereotype of him of course, because he was a black man. Um, and in the, second, uh, in the second quote, we spoke a lot about unconscious bias. And I think that's really reflected in that quote. Our staff quite clearly felt that 
um, quick and easy solutions weren't enough and that what we actually need to do is promote lifelong learning to combat the stereotypes and the unconscious bias that can lead to disproportionate use of force. Um, next slide, please. Now, drawing all of this together, um, I think some of the take home messages is that Shaney's law provides a useful structure, but the actual changes we want require a cultural shift in services. I don't think we fully know what that change would look like. So we first want to encourage reflection in our roles as individuals, as professionals and organizations to challenge um, the underlying perceptions and assumptions that lead to use of force. And then once we do that, we can lobby the government for um, more detailed um, change. Um, what we also really need is more detailed research on seclusion and restraint. I'm a researcher and as has been mentioned before, we're trying to address structural racism. And in order to really have a good picture of um, what we need to change. Um, we need detailed data on ethnicity and other protected characteristics across services that's reliable. We also need to know which holds are being used, especially since so many men um, have died in the prone position, including Shaney and Sean. And finally, we need to make some concrete resource commitments once we decide on what actions that we want to take. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll share these slides um, after the presentation. And this here is just an overview of the Colorful Minds report, um, which you can read in your own time. Um, next slide, please. Um, Aji and Marcia um, have worked with us to produce a film called R.I.P. Shaney, which really goes into these issues in more detail. It's only 20 minutes long and I would really encourage you to um, have a look so that it places less onus on the families to have to repeat their story. And finally, I just wanted to shout out, um, next slide please. Yeah, I also wanted to shout out that the United Friends and Families campaign are doing a march on Saturday, Trafalgar Square, 12 p.m. Um, where um, it's an annual march that they've been doing for over 20 years now, and it's really to campaign for the rights of the families to be, uh, well, to put forward Shaney's law, but also for their own personal support. Um, they are, without them, none of this work could have been done. All right, thank you. <laughs>